The term that comes easiest to mind is ghosts. But the lights on the hill weren't ghosts. Or if they were, I am not sure what ghosts are, as of course I am not. I can't say what they are, but I knew when I encountered them. And the hill itself may have had something to do with it. Down at the bottom, near my house, there is the graveyard. And I was thinking about Annie's story on the night I passed it, coming home. And something pulled my coat. I'd like to say that I felt something, which is to say some presence. But all I felt was the tug on my coat sleeve. I was walking dead on the crown of the road. The night was pitch dark and I was on the crown to avoid any possibility of branches whipping my face. I was thinking of what Annie had said. When she was young, she said, she lived in the white house, up the hill from my house, above the graveyard. She was walking one day when she was young, and all of a sudden there was a man by her side. On the lonely dirt road in the country, and all of a sudden, there was someone there. She told me he was dressed oddly, in a fashion out of the past, and she said she felt frightened. The man nodded and asked her name. She was young and had been cautioned by her parents not to talk to strangers, so she didn't respond. He told her that his name was Anders. She walked up to her farmhouse. Later that night, she told her parents. They said that Anders had been the name of the hired man back in their grandparents' time. And it was of this that I was thinking when I walked in the crown of the road by the graveyard that night and something pulled on my coat sleeve. Then there were the moving stars I'd seen, some 15 miles from the town and 25 years back one winter night when I was young. There were five or six of them in the sky. They looked like stars. They would be still for a while. Then they would move in a group or cluster for a while and dart as if they were chasing one another from one side of the sky to the other. Sometimes they would shoot across. Sometimes they'd move slowly to the other horizon where they regrouped into various patterns. I was with several friends. We watched for a while, then telephoned to the Air Force Base in Plattsburgh to report what we'd seen. The fellow there thanked us. We asked if he had had other reports of the objects, and he said no, he had not. We asked what he thought they might be, and he said he had no idea. After I got home that night, up my hill, 25 years later, once again, I saw the lights. It was four in the morning. I was tired. I was alone in the house. I was brushing my teeth. I glanced out the window and up the hill, up past the cemetery, past the white house, up the hill, up at the crest of the hill, or as they say, at the height of land, there was a light. It was a bright light, like truck-mounted beacons we would see at a film opening, or like an anti-aircraft beacon scanning the sky, as if it were describing a cone whose point was on the ground. The shaft of light circled slowly. The beam was much stronger than truck-mounted Klieg lights, and it was pure white. On the ground, beyond the trees at the edge of the field, just at the top of the hill, was this beacon. I nodded and, in my exhausted state, went on preparing for bed. And then I asked myself what the light was up the hill. Well, that's just... I started to explain. And then I stopped, as I realized that I had no idea what it was, or what it possibly could be. I set myself to suggest a scenario that would put that light up the hill. I went back to the window, and it was still there, circling slowly. 
I was fascinated by the white purity of the light, and I remember thinking that I'd never seen a light that white before. What could it be? It was a signal of some sort, but to whom and by whom? And why would it be here, in the middle of the night, on a peaceful country road in Vermont? One summer evening, some years back, I had been sitting on the porch of this same house, looking by chance up the road at the White House, which was vacant at that time, and I saw a small fire burning below the barn. I remember that I thought as I watched it, that's just a... and when I could not discount it, I walked up the hill to find a rapidly spreading fire in the brush, now caught on the barn. I tried to get it out, but it had grown too big for me, so I ran back and called the village fire department. They got the fire out, and I basked for some long time afterward in a self-awarded sentiment of rural neighborliness. For if I had not seen it, I thought, or recognized it, or investigated it, or acted upon it, the barn and the house would have burned. And it was the memory of this feeling of neighborliness that moved me to decide to climb the hill to investigate the light. For there was no one in the White House, and there was no one living in the house beyond it, the house across from the field from which the light was coming. There was no one on the hill but me, and I must have felt that the light boded malevolence or danger, for when I redressed myself and started out of my house, I took a gun. It was four in the morning of an early spring night as I opened my door, and I congratulated myself on my courage. Many, I thought, would not venture that half mile up the hill. Many would stay in their homes, I thought. And I asked myself why they would do that. And I answered they would do that because the light meant great danger. And I became fearful. I went back in my house, closing the door softly, as one moves when one is a child, and moving in the dark so as not to draw the notice of the evil creatures in the room. I went back in my house and looked out of the window, and saw the light was still there, up the hill. I asked myself if I was content to live in ignorance of the nature of the light, and as much as I piqued myself with my cowardice, I found that I wasn't going to climb the hill. I undressed and got into bed. Although my mind was busy, I fell asleep, and I awakened some time later to a great feeling of fear and a brilliant, all-pervading white light pouring in my bedroom window, as if the source were down, just outside of my house. And then I fell asleep again. The next morning I asked everyone in town if they'd seen or heard anything, or if they could account for the lights I had seen, and they'd seen nothing, and could not explain it. And down at the bottom of the old sugaring lane on my property, there is a dip in the land at the intersection of the lane with our dirt road, which marks the site of the town's earliest settlement 200 years ago. In any case, down the hill from my house, the land slopes to a depression at the bottom of what was the old lane. There was and remains something about that spot. I do not like it. I put a small compost pile there. It seemed fitting for a low, hidden, and somehow unpleasant spot. Perhaps you've noticed spots like that. Not in the city where the land is covered, but out in the country or the woods. Perhaps you felt the spots that are happy, and the spots that exude danger, as if they were sending the message, Ignore me at your peril. You should not be here. I put the small compost pile in the hollow at the bottom of the hill. Up by my house, between the house and the cemetery, near the road, there was a swing set. And one afternoon I was pushing my daughter on the swing, and my eye went beyond her, down the hill, 
down to a form by the compost pile. It was the form of a man, and it was dead white from head to foot. I saw it for a second, then it disappeared. I wondered if it had been conjured somehow out of my feelings of antipathy for the spot. Some weeks later, it must have been at the end of summer, for there were apples on the trees, my daughter asked me to climb to get her an apple, which I did. She took a bite and told me that it was too early and the apple was sour and she didn't want any more. What should I do with it? she asked. And I told her to walk the 50 feet down to the compost pile. No, she said. I don't want to go there. There's a monster that lives there. And there were people talking outside of various houses in the night. One summer in a cottage at North Hero, one whole fall back in the 60s when I lived with friends in a rented trailer in the woods. That fall, there were two men talking outside all night, night after night, till one of us, left alone one night, called the state police. They searched and found nothing. And when we returned from our school vacations, or wherever we had been, we all said to one another, Oh my God, you've heard it too? Like the old woman at the house outside of Newport. A friend told me about the house on the lake, and I took it for a summer, and heard the old woman crying and scolding in the night, and went outside so many times to see her but there was never anything there. Back in New York in the fall, the friend who'd suggested the house asked how the summer had gone. I told her it went well. Is the ghost still there? She asked. Yes, I told her. The ghost is still there.